Well, I think it's time for a new series. My last one, which I very much doubt you will recall, was on the Old Testament book of uh, Judges. So I thought it was time to migrate to the New Testament and I've selected the book of Galatians. And I'm going to commence with a bit of good news for you. With my series on Judges, there were nine talks. There are only six on Galatians, so 33% less listening or viewing time. So there's a good start. This is going to be uh, an introductory talk, which will then set the scene for uh, the rest of the series. Next time, we're going to look at the topic of the Apostle Paul's authority. T talk three will take us to uh, what Galatians teaches about the law. Talk four will be taken up with the benefits of the gospel. Then in talk five, we'll be looking at two ways of living, the flesh versus the spirit. And finally, talk six will be concerned then with some practical exhortations. The learned among you will of course know that there are six chapters in Galatians and broadly speaking, each talk will deal with one chapter. The exception to that is actually this one. I'm going to be taking you all over the letter uh, on the, in this case. We're going to start then by thinking a bit about the book itself. The author is of course the Apostle Paul. Verse 1 of chapter 1 uh, makes that explicit. Whilst in verse 11 of chapter 6, we're told really that Paul's own signature was employed to affirm that the letter was truly dictated by himself. The recipients of the letter, and I'll use the term letter and book interchangeably, the recipients are said to be the churches at Galatia. You see that in verse 2 of chapter 1. And this is where we hit a little bit of controversy. You see, there are two views here about the recipients. One is that it refers to ethnic Galatians, who were really a, a tribal people who lived in central Asia Minor. And this is referred to as the North Galatian theory. Or it could refer, maybe more likely, but who am I to say? It could refer to the inhabitants of the Roman province of Galatia and its cities of Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And this is known as, no doubt you've guessed, the South Galatian theory. If the North Galatian theory is correct, then in order to harmonize what is said in this letter with what is recorded about Paul's missionary journeys in the book of Acts, this would date the letter rather later than that suggested by the South Galatian theory. Indeed, if the South Galatian theory is right, then Galatians would probably be the earliest of the Apostle Paul's letters. Possibly dated, some commentators say it could even be as early as AD 48. So, you know, we're not that far away from the actual death of Jesus Christ. The North Galatian theory, on the other hand, would date Galatians a bit later maybe around A.D. 56. Now, to be honest, I don't think this debate, whilst of interest to the experts, need detain us. For really, it makes no material difference to the content of what we're going to be considering in this series. I did feel the need to mention it, but my advice is that we leave it to the experts to debate amongst themselves. What we can be certain of 
is that it was the Apostle Paul who brought the gospel to the Galatians. Let's just read uh, a few verses here. If we tur- the best thing is if you have your Bible and you, you know, read it along with me. So Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to read just uh, verses 13 to 15. Obviously, I'm just breaking into his argument. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Evidently, as a result of some illness, Paul had encountered these Galatians who had responded positively to his preaching of the gospel. Incidentally, some commentators believe that the reference by Paul here to his eyes, or to eyes, plus the later reference in chapter 6 to the large letters that Paul used in his handwriting, may support the view that Paul suffered from some sort of eye disease, perhaps one that led to a less than attractive appearance. Hence verse 14, Though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Irrespective, it's clear that a very close bond had been forged between Paul and the Galatian converts, but that bond was now under severe tension. And this takes me then to Paul's reason for writing the letter. Now, we are going to read quite a few passages of Scripture. So, fasten your seatbelt here because there's quite a few, as I say. We'll begin uh, in chapter 1 from verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, or anathema. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. If you want to flick over, or if you're under 30 years of age, if you want to scroll down and move to chapter 4, verse 10. Now, again, obviously, we're just breaking in to Paul's arguments here. You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Move on down to verse 17. Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. And just skip on to verse 19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Move on to chapter 5, verse 2. 
Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. And finally, if you move to chapter 6, verse 12. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Now I know that was uh, quite a bit to, to uh, take in there, but we're trying to get a flavor of uh, the letter. And what we can deduce from these readings is that the Galatians have allowed themselves to come under the sway of false teachers who are perverting the gospel as it had been presented to them by the Apostle Paul. A gospel which they had previously readily embraced. And Paul is exasperated. He is astonished. Chapter 1, verse 6. He is perplexed. Chapter 4, verse 20. He just cannot get over how quickly they are deserting the true gospel and embracing a different gospel, which he says is really no gospel at all. Chapter 1, verse 6. Paul's error is evident respecting the false teachers themselves, and thus his rather sort of colorful language regarding his desire that these false teachers would emasculate themselves, chapter 6, verse 12, and his double pronouncement of an anathema or curse upon them in chapter 1. At face value, it isn't difficult to surmise what these false teachers were advocating. The one thing that stands out is the emphasis upon circumcision. The Galatian Christians were being told that circumcision was necessary if they were to be fully right with God. Obviously, this then reflected the Jewish background of the false teachers. Add to circumcision the references to observing special days and months and seasons and years, the Jewish sacrifices and festivals, and it's clear that these Galatian believers, many of whom would have been from a Gentile background, were being sort of Judaized 
aspects of the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, were being added to faith in Christ. Observance of this Mosaic law was thus becoming or being made an indispensable part of salvation. And the Apostle Paul was having none of it. It is interesting to observe the sort of tactics of these false teachers as they infiltrated the Galatian churches with their heresy. What they tried to do was really to undermine and discredit the Apostle Paul, thus driving a wedge between Paul and his converts. Thus he refers to their attempts to alienate the Galatians from himself and his co-workers, chapter 4, verse 17. And we can tell that these false teachers were claiming that Paul was a hypocrite, for they were alleging that irrespective of what he had told the Galatians when he was with them, he was actually preaching circumcision when he was in the company of others. Thus Paul exclaims, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Chapter 5, verse 11. In other words, I cannot be doing what my critics are accusing me of. For if I were preaching the need for circumcision, thereby removing the offense of the cross to the Jews, then why am I still being persecuted by my fellow countrymen? I preach the irrelevance of circumcision to everyone. And he actually says in chapter 6, verse 17, I have the marks on my body to prove it. The marks of being persecuted because he was offending the Jews, his fellow countrymen, by saying that circumcision was unnecessary. And Paul is scathing with regard to the motives of these false teachers. What they want is to cultivate their own following. They want the Galatians to be zealous for them. Chapter 4, verse 17. And what lies behind this is at least partly their own fear of being persecuted. Chapter 6, verse 12. For if they could get the Galatian converts to accept the necessity of circumcision then the offense of the cross to Orthodox Jews would have been mitigated and they would receive the credit for effecting such a reconciliation. But Paul is not going to give up on the Galatians easily for he knows that the very core of the gospel is at stake and thus he does not mince his words in attacking his opponents and slaying their heretical teaching. And that brings me then to the central theme of the letter. That is justification by faith. Justification by faith. It was indeed through his personal meditations on the book of Galatians that Martin Luther was brought to understand the gospel message that salvation is an entirely free gift, born of God's grace and impossible for man to contribute towards by his own good deeds. Man is justified, that is declared righteous in God's sight by faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice at Calvary. For man to seek to add to that sacrifice by way of his own merit or law keeping or circumcision is to destroy the gospel. And hence Paul denounces the Judaizers message as being a different gospel. And he famously proclaims his double anathema upon the, first, upon the false teachers that we saw in verses eight to nine of chapter one. 
Now, there will be much more to say about the gospel as we make our way through this series. But what I would like to do is to finish this talk, as with all the talks in the series, with a couple of practical lessons. How does what we have been reading and reflecting upon uh, now apply to our lives? And if just two practical lessons. Number one, be vigilant for false teachers and false teaching. Be vigilant for false teachers and false teaching. It didn't take very long before the converts in the Galatian churches were subjected to false teaching. And this is something the Bible warns will be a constant menace of the church age. Jesus himself warned of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ferocious wolves. Matthew 7, verse 15. Paul warned the Ephesian elders that even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, verse 30. He also warned Titus that there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. Titus 1, verse 10. Peter declared that just as there were false prophets in times past, so there will be false teachers among you. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. Likewise, the apostle John spoke of many deceivers who have gone out into the world, 2 John verse 7. And Paul told his protege, Timothy, that the time would come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. Do you get the point? Let us not be surprised that there is false teaching out there. Indeed, false teaching and false teachers have infiltrated not just Christendom at large, but even parts of the evangelical church. Thus, the doctrine of the atonement, for example, has been attacked by some who profess to be evangelicals, and yet there is no more fundamental doctrine than God punishing Christ for our sins. It is thus imperative that we are all on our spiritual guard and don't succumb to revisionist arguments however eloquently or cleverly expressed or whatever the source. And you know, let us thank God for those theologians and academics and pastors and commentators who do uphold the core doctrines of the Christian faith, the centrality of grace, the substitutionary death of Jesus, his bodily resurrection, his promised return, and so on. But let's not be naive. False teaching and false teachers are out there. Their influence is manifest and will increase with the passage of time. And we need to try to ensure that they never get a foothold in Castlereagh Fellowship. Secondly, be clear as to what the gospel says. Logically, this practical lesson really precedes the first one. For how can we detect error if we don't first understand the truth? Of course, there are aspects of the gospel which are mysterious. Mysterious. 
We rightly say that we cannot comprehend all that went on between God the Father and God the Son at the cross, for example. And then there are aspects of Christian doctrine on which even conservative Christians disagree. Things like baptism, the practice of spiritual gifts, the timeline and the precise events surrounding the return of Jesus Christ and so on. But I'm thinking about gospel fundamentals and the fact that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice is the most fundamental doctrine of all. Let us be clear in our minds that nothing adds to Christ's sacrifice. Indeed, to seek to add is only to subtract. There's good gospel mathematics for you. Addition is subtraction. To add anything to Christ's sacrifice is to take away from the completeness of that sacrifice. Nothing that I can do adds one iota to the value of Christ's sacrifice, for that sacrifice is of infinite value. And so as we interact with Roman Catholics or church-going Protestants who think that they are achieving merit in God's eyes by their good works, we must be crystal clear that such thinking is false. It is heresy. It is heresy that damns people to eternal perdition. Gospel clarity is essential for people's eternity depends upon it. Thank God then for men who follow in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, who refuse the temptation to obscure or dilute the gospel for the sake of a quiet life. And surely it is fitting that the final word goes to the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Amen.